Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. The United States has officially relocated its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. The highly anticipated move has signified Washington's recognition of the city as the capital of the Jewish state, a move resented among many across the international community. To discuss Israel's international standing following the American move, I'm joined here in the studio by Professor Ephraim Inbar, who is the president of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategic Studies. Welcome. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and uh, Dr. Eran Lerman, who is the Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategic Studies and a lecturer at Shalem College. Welcome. Mr. Oren, give us a broader understanding of the current situation. By way of uh, background, uh, this may surprise you and not only you, but when President Truman recognized the State of Israel on May uh, 14th, 1948, he recognized it without Jerusalem within the boundaries of Israel, because what the uh, new, uh, newly established uh, state of Israel asked Truman to recognize were the boundaries of United Nations Resolution 181 from uh, November 29, 1947. It specifically stated, we uh, wish the United States to recognize our state in the boundaries of the so-called partition plan. And therefore, for the last 70 years, when Israel had armistice agreements with Jordan, uh, which was in control of uh, East Jerusalem at the time, and later peace agreements with Jordan and Egypt, but they had uh, nothing officially to do with East Jerusalem. Jerusalem was not considered the capital of Israel officially, even though business was conducted uh, with uh, the country in Jerusalem. Now, comes President Trump and says, we are now recognizing Jerusalem, meaning West Jerusalem, as the capital of Israel. We will have to see what the Palestinians are going to get in return for their acquiescence, even though they demonstrated, but with their acquiescence with this new fact. Professor Inbaum? I think that uh, basically common sense prevailed. Jerusalem has been declared by Israel as its capital. Uh, every country has a right uh, to choose its capital. Nobody really <coughs> uh, disputes Israeli control and sovereignty over West Jerusalem. So I see no reason why the United States or any other country should move its embassy uh, to, to Jerusalem. Uh, unless they uh, indicate some displeasure or uh, unwillingness to accept Israel, Israel's hold upon West Jerusalem. No, the reason was, as you well know, that they considered Jerusalem, all of Jerusalem, a separate entity uh, belonging to no other country. This may be a fiction, but uh, this is their diplomatic concept. But this is totally unrealistic. Of course. Dr. Lerman? <clears throat> First of all, uh, we need to also remember in the historical context that when you say, what is the, unite, the position of the United States? Well, uh, the, the Constitution of the United States made foreign policy um, a field of conflict between the legislative and the uh, branch and the administration. The position of the United States legislative branch, Congress, both houses, has been for well more than a generation that United Jerusalem is the eternal capital of Israel. And that has, has passed. I, I remember quite vividly that when George Bush, the father, took certain steps that included a reference to Israeli settlements in, in East Jerusalem, the response in the Senate was a, 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 a vote of 100 to 0 in support of the Israeli position. Bush couldn't even rely on his loyal Republican friend at the time, Bob Dole, mm -hmm. uh, 100 to 0. So this was the position of the, of the US Congress uh, representing the American people. And therefore, this was held by waiver uh, under, under several administrations. And by the way, practically every president, including Barack Obama, promised during their campaign to move the embassy to Jerusalem and then broke their promise. So this is not quite uh, such a dramatic turnaround. Where I do see a very great significance to what happened is that it breaks the paradigm that the, the, the solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict will rest upon something approaching the Arab interpretation 
of the UN relevant UN resolutions. That's not the proper interpretation. I can go into a discussion mm -hmm. of what 242 entails and what it does not. I think we can go back to language used by the Johnson administration to indicate that they never intended Israel to totally withdraw to the 67 lines. The Trump administration has now taken a very significant step towards breaking that paradigm and preparing the ground for a practical compromise, mm -hmm. one that does not rest upon unrealistic or undeliverable Arab expectations. And also breaking, obviously, the legacy of President uh, Barack Obama when we're talking about Resolution 2334, which uh, tried to separate Jerusalem from the state of Israel, or at least its aspiration of having a united Jerusalem as its capital. Mr. Owen? Yes, but uh, this is uh, correct. But uh, President George W. Bush, Obama's predecessor, came out in June of 2002, uh, approximately the same time that the Saudis came out with their initiative, and Bush was the first American president to recognize a two-state solution. Now, if you are going to say that uh, adjacent to Israel there will be a Palestinian state, one uh, reasonably expects that it will have uh, a capital in or near East Jerusalem. So the demarcation line is an issue, even though no one disputes, not even the Palestinians, that West Jerusalem, which was wholly Jewish, there were no Palestinians in West Jerusalem uh, at any time uh, in history. West Jerusalem was built outside the walls in order uh, for uh, newly arrived Jewish inhabitants uh, to settle in. But nevertheless, the Palestinians uh, have uh, a claim uh, to East Jerusalem, as does Israel. So there will be a compromise, uh, there will be a demarcation uh, within East Jerusalem, which is a broader term than the old city itself uh, within the world. And of course, there are the, the holy sites there. There are many problems which uh, in Camp David too, in uh, the year 2000, Barack and Arafat, they failed uh, to solve uh, with, with Clinton presiding. There are, there's a whole uh, lot uh, of problems regarding East Jerusalem as distinct from West Jerusalem. But eventually, if there is uh, going to be a Palestinian state, East Jerusalem or a great part of it will have to be uh, part of uh, this state. With a focus on two words, if and will uh, uh, this uh, demarcation ever occur, uh, considering the fact that uh, Professor Inbound, neither side has political backing, the support of their people for an actual two-state solution. So what are we actually talking about? I think that uh, Palestinians have no reason to hold the veto power over uh, the decision of other governments to move their embassies to Jerusalem. Moreover, I think their claim to Jerusalem is very weak. If we take a look at the history, for the past uh, 170 years, uh, the Jews have been a majority in the city. Uh, Jerusalem has never been a capital of any Muslim or, of, or Arab entity. Uh, and finally, I think uh, that we as democratic people, maybe we should ask the Arabs in Jerusalem if they want to be part of a Palestinian state, if it will ever be there. Uh, I think that all polls show that the Palestinians, uh, with a good sense of reality, understand. But there is the, something uh, contradictory in your logic. If they are going to have a sovereign country, they should be free to choose their capital, as you said about uh, Israel. Fine, but why should uh, the residents of Jerusalem not be participants in such a process? And we should ask them first if they are willing to live in a Palestinian state, which is a few miles away, it's an authoritarian state, a corrupt state. Uh, the standard of living there is 10 times as less as in Israel. And uh, the Arabs in Israel, in Jerusalem, actually, uh, we see them uh, nowadays more willing to participate in municipal uh, politics. Uh, they are even ready to run lists for the municipality, political lists. And uh, there is a process of Israelization in among the Arabs in Jerusalem. Moreover, they want to study the Israeli curriculum. We do not meet the demand of the Arabs in Jerusalem for such classes because it costs money. We do not invest uh, enough uh, money in, in East Jerusalem. So uh, I think, you know, uh, if somebody wants to get married, we should ask uh, 
as a lady, if she's interested, I don't think the Arabs in Jerusalem have any, you know, majority of them have no reason whatsoever to, to live in a Palestinian state. Dr. Lerman, uh, you're talking time and again about this paradigm shift and about the uh, shift of perception with regard to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the way that President Trump has uh, brought a new reality to uh, the foreground. Uh, to what degree does this uh, have implications on the ground? Look, first, first of all, the most dramatic aspect of what happened is what not didn't happen. This did not lead to the best of our understanding to a breach between the key Arab Sunni, uh, moderate or pragmatic countries, pro-Western countries, and the Trump administration. Um, you would have expected it, but it didn't happen. You would, the rhetoric and the UN resolutions still played the old game, but in the uh, actual political effect, there was nothing that uh, deterred the American administration from going forward. And um, this is because Practically for no one now, the Palestinian question is the first priority. It still, it gets paid, they, get, they pay lip service. But for the enemies of Israel, it's not the Palestinians. It's the eradication, the Iran and in, in the camp of resistance. For them, the eradication of Israel is a religious duty that has to do with their identity as an Islamic revolution, it has nothing to do with the actual needs of actual Palestinians. Uh, for uh, the Saudis and the Egyptians, they are much more important matters. For the Egyptians, it's the Muslim Brotherhood and the terrorist question. For the Saudis, the Gulf states, it's Iran. And therefore, uh, we saw this in the summer uh, of uh, 2017 on, on the uh, um, Temple Mount question, on the uh, metal detector question. There was basically not even a whimper from much of the Arab world. That was a very strong indication. So when Palestinian, when Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas is talking about tough consequences with regard to this uh, relocation of the embassy and the American aspirations to uh, assert uh, or ascertain Israel's uh, uh, sovereignty over whole of Jerusalem, to what degree does this actually imply just rhetoric with no cards in uh, uh, any of the hands or is this actually something that we still are expected to, uh, to see in the near future? If, if the term was not occupied for other purposes, I would say this is pathetic. Um, he has no leverage on the American administration. The only thing he can do is to save himself from the need to sit at the table and negotiate difficult compromises, which he probably is uh, incapable of doing. He has his merits. He, he understood, unlike his predecessor, Yasser Arafat, that the use of violence, uh, of, of armed violence, systemic armed violence by the Palestinian Authority, not, to, not individuals who are uh, eulogized and rewarded, but uh, systemic, as Arafat did uh, in, from 2000 and, uh, October 2000 onwards, uh, has been disastrous for the Palestinians. That he understood, and he has held to this, and we need to pay him some respect for this. But he has no capacity to cut a compromise that will be deliverable and acceptable. And <coughs> he will simply say, you know, uh, we are not interested in doing this within the American framework. Absolve himself from the necessity of, uh, of making such compromises, and we'll all sit around and wait for his successor. Mr. Owen? The uh, high-level negotiations between the Israelis and the Palestinians uh, broke off uh, when Netanyahu took over from Olmert in early 2009 and decided uh, to cut short uh, the so-called Annapolis process. And even though uh, he has uh, given in to uh, Obama's uh, dictate regarding the freeze on the settlements for several months, nothing came of it. And this was the time when Netanyahu had to come out in his Barilan address uh, for a two-state uh, solution, which he has not repeated uh, recently. Now, uh, Iran Lemon is, of course, right. Uh, the Palestinians, uh, powers that be in the region, do not really care about the Palestinians. 
They do care about closing the Palestinian file. They need some political cover. They need the Palestinian leadership to tell them, okay, there is an acceptable formula. Uh, this is what we are going to negotiate, and uh, you can uh, go your separate ways. It's fine with us. It hasn't happened yet because on both uh, sides, both the Palestinian and the Israeli side, uh, there is a lot of suspicion, mutual suspicion. And as far as we know, there has not been any clandestine channel between the governments. One should not wait for them to come out uh, overtly, sit at a table and start negotiating. The summit should be the end of the process, not uh, its start. As far as we know, there is no meeting of the minds and um, President Trump, uh, uh, through uh, his uh, emissaries, Jason Greenblatt and Jared Kushner, uh, apparently has not been able to uh, bridge the gap. Nevertheless, for years, uh, Professor Weinbaum, we heard uh, rhetoric coming from Arab states every time there was some kind of uh, challenge to the various regimes uh, with regard to Israel and the enemy. And this is something that has unified uh, the public opinion in support of rallying behind a cause. Uh, this has changed in uh, recent years towards the Islamic Republic of Iran, when also the Arab public, to a certain extent, understands that Israel is also aligned in that same camp in confronting this threat. To what uh, degree does this actually uh, formulate some kind of realization that indeed Israel has the capacity of, of bringing about some kind of resolution or has a better international standing among also the Arab nations in order to ascertain its sovereignty over the land of Israel? I think that we do see a historic process uh, among the Arabs that there is a growing realization that Israel is a fact that cannot be easily eradicated, and the price for trying it may be too high. Uh, we see it particularly at the elite level, less so at the popular level. Um, this is true, of course, of Egypt and Jordan that signed a peace treaty with Israel. Uh, we see it now uh, in Saudi Arabia, in the Gulf states, some Maghreb countries. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it's uh, not uh, um, <clears throat> divorced from another process, which is the retreat of the United States from, from the Middle East. Mm -hmm. So basically, they are facing alone now uh, the, the Iranian growing power. And uh, unfortunately mm -hmm. for them, it's only that Israel that can, to some extent, deliver the counterweight Against, against the Iranians. And there is another uh, important uh, phenomenon that is taking place in the Middle East, which increases the importance of Israel for those countries, the Islamization of Turkey. Turkey also could have been a counterweight to Iran. It's a big country, it's a Sunni country. But uh, what's happening in, uh, in Turkey uh, since Erdogan took power, is, uh, the fa is Islamization that brings the two countries, Turkey and Iran, closer. And again, it's only Israel that can, to some extent, mm -hmm. be a counterweight to the growing power of Iran. Dr. Leoman, uh, the main obstacle to the recognition of Jerusalem and the uh, uh, allowance to a certain extent of uh, certain countries in the international community to relocate their embassy in the footsteps of the United States here in Jerusalem uh, is the European Union and its adamant stance that Jerusalem must be negotiated uh, on the basis of East Jerusalem for the Palestinians and West Jerusalem for Israel. Uh, to what degree is this actually uh, engraved in stone? It, or is there somewhere a possibility of seeing here some kind of shift? Uh, just for instance, uh, Poland that came out with uh, a statement, at least from its prime minister, with regard to the relocation Czech or aspired. <coughs> the Czech Republic. The Czech Republic the as well. Uh, Indeed. Several countries, but all of them set down a, a small disclaimer, if you will, right. that as long as... Uh, uh, or at least it continues to maintain that uh, the policy of the European Union is that that should be adhered to. Well, clearly there is a, there's a, Israel has a problem with the uh, position of the EU as a collective. It has excellent bilateral relations with many member states. It has made 
huge inroads in countries which were historically difficult uh, and sometimes hostile in their attitude in the southern arc from Greece and Cyprus all the way to Spain. It certainly has many friends in Eastern Europe who understand uh, the perspective of na uh, the Zionism as a nationalist movement and the history of our uh, complex, difficult relations with countries that were supported by the Soviet Union. All of this creates a situation where Israel has uh, great room for maneuver among the member states. But as you say, it is more or less the, um, an article of faith for the EU establishment that the Palestinians, uh, that the solution to the Palestinian question has to respond to Palestinian expectations. That, of course, uh, has the precisely the opposite effect than that, the, the one that I assume the Europeans, uh, uh, charitably I say the Europeans probably really want to promote peace. And the result of this purist position makes peace impossible because the moment they generate Palestinian expectations to that level, <clears throat> there can be no meeting ground. Once this paradigm begins to break also in Europe, and I think this is not impossible, uh, and I would look to France, for example, uh, many, for many years a country with a very problematic position, but now increasingly oriented towards uh, the anti-Iranian alliance in the region and attentive also to our needs. Uh, I would say that it's not impossible to expect that our, over time, if, if, I, I will grant this, if Israel does not completely abandon the vision of a, of a compromise, of a two-state solution, some kind of two-state solution down the road, um, I think that there may be a shift towards the something closer to the, shall I call it, the Trump, Trump paradigm. Because we have to remember, the Trump paradigm is not what the Israeli, some Israelis hoped it would be sort of a kind of a, a blessing for anything Israel might ever want and the uh, annexation of the West Bank. Mm -hmm. This is certainly not what uh, Greenblatt and, and, the, and the, on the ground and the team has been working on. Uh, so if we have progress on, on certain aspects, even if the uh, top-down process is blocked, a lot of work continues to be done with Greenblatt's help, by the way, on the bottom-up relationship. There are no secret channels, but there are overt channels. Uh, our Minister of Finance, Kahlon, is meeting regularly with the Palestinian Prime Minister, Rami Hamadala, who nowadays is being mentioned as a potential successor. That's a very interesting indication that not all is, uh, not all is lost in the Israeli-Palestinian relationship. If enough things mature over time, I think the European position could be open to reconsideration. Mr. Oren? There is an emotional dimension to Jerusalem in both the Israeli and the Palestinian and even Arab and Muslim at large uh, camps. Um, and this is a distinction because uh, other problems, uh, security or, or borders, of course they are important, but they are not emotional. They can be solved by rational uh, leaders. But Jerusalem uh, is different. Now, if um, there was a formula to be adopted by the leaders and referred to the publics, and in the Palestinian case, it is also the Palestinian diaspora, because the refugees would have to somehow uh, um, give a piece of, uh, of their collective uh, mind. If there was to be such a solution, uh, and if it could have been taken out of the domestic political debate, then Israel could finally adopt a grand strategy. Because up to now, Israel has been conducting a day-to-day -day policy in which it is quite successful. It hasn't been pushed back from its acquisitions. But one doesn't see how it derives from any broader strategy. Where do you want to get? How um, are you uh, planning to stop bleeding, uh, to devote so many resources, uh, the uh, best years of your youth and, and many other uh, assets to this problem? So if Israel finds within it the strength to come out with a position which the Palestinians could not refuse to discuss at least, uh, we will have made progress. Professor um, Inman? You are not surprised that I disagree with you. No. <laughs> uh, I think that Israel has a strategy. 
a clear strategy. Our strategy is uh, conflict management. I think uh, most Israelis have realized that there is no uh, way to get a compromise, uh, acceptable compromise with the uh, Palestinians. Uh, and since they are continuing the struggle, the violent struggle against Israel, we see it you know, on the Gaza border every day, uh, every weekend, uh, we must uh, try to gain time and to defer difficult uh, decisions uh, when there will be a partner. Uh, I think that the, even the settlement policy of uh, the Israeli government, of the right-wing government, is reflecting this uh, type of... Uh, um, conflict management, uh, trying to not to expand uh, too much uh, territorially with settlements. Uh, and uh, hopefully there will be uh, a next uh, leadership in the Palestinian uh, authority. Don't forget that the Palestinians cannot put their act together because they are mm-hmm. divided between Hamas and, and the Palestinian authority. And we shouldn't forget that Israel has made great offers in the past, which were rejected by the Palestinians. So probably uh, we all realize that not every problem has a solution, and therefore we have to manage the conflict to limit uh, bloodshed on both sides. Dr. Lerman, you noted uh, that uh, President Abbas is trying to uh, keep, uh, for the most extent, uh, some kind of... Uh, uh, tranquility among the Palestinians, as well as Mr. Owen has noted that, uh, with regard to uh, choosing the course of peaceful demonstration. Also, when he was re-elected uh, as uh, the chairman of the PLO, he once again reaffirmed his commitment to uh, pursue a, a peaceful uh, uh political process. Uh, nevertheless, of course, he doesn't have the power over all the Palestinians, as Professor Inbar has uh, mentioned. Uh, to what degree, uh, considering the fact that this is not working for him, uh, for the full extent, and the reality on the ground is not what the Europeans want, but rather what the Israelis and the Americans want, to what degree might this shift now, with this paradigm shift that you're talking about, to a more violent uh, uprising on their part? Well, the the potential is there. We've seen Arab countries go into all, all kinds of convulsions. However, those who have uh, experienced the bitter lesson of violence before, like Algeria or Lebanon, with a history of a civil war, uh, interestingly enough, were the countries that avoided being swept into chaos in the post-2011 period, which is a very notable uh, exception to, to the regional rule. The Palestinians also. Uh, in Gaza, they have seen the consequences of armed conflict, and we have to take note. While we have these, those incidents and these, these uh, violent attacks on, on, on the border, they have not reopened rocket fire in a systemic way for the best part of four years now. That's an indication. Mm-hmm. I think in the same case, the same goes for uh, the Palestinian leadership, and particularly the military leadership. Uh, Today, the Palestinian military command is unified under Majid Farage in a way that was not the case under Arafat when several organizations were busy spying on each other. And this coordination continues. And they understand the value of coordination. This is all the time, unfortunately, that we have for today. So I'd like to thank Professor Inbar, Mr. Oren, and Dr. Lehrman for coming here today. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next time. TV7 Israel's mission is to give you, our viewers, truthful information, which in effect will give you a chance to really understand what is happening in Israel and its region. If you are blessed by our programs and believe our mission to be important, we urge you to support us and become a voice for Israel. You can support us by going to our website at tv7israelnews.com. This program was made possible through your donations.